Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm Bob Mandel, faculty director of the uh, International Affairs Symposium, and welcome to the um, evening session of the 52nd Annual International Affairs Symposium. Uh, this place is jam-packed, and you should know that we have an overflow crowd in STEM, so if you have any friends who are there, you can be guaranteed that they'll be seeing a simulcast of this event. I'm just going to make a few remarks and introduce a few people, and then we'll be up and going. Um, as many of you know, this is the oldest student-run symposium in the United States, or at least we're told that. It's been uh, covered in the New York Times and um, other important uh, national publications. And one of the things that really makes me proud to be the advisor to this symposium is that the students do work an entire year picking the topic, picking the sessions, picking the speakers, making all the critical decisions. And this group that I've worked with this year has been you know, just incredible. Um, and uh, I really think that any success in this symposium is due to the effort of these students. One of the things that characterizes this symposium and makes it very different from other symposia around the country and other symposia at Lewis and Clark is that we want to make sure that in each and every session there is disagreement and alternative views presented. We do not believe that it is appropriate at a liberal arts college open to alternative views that simply one viewpoint be presented and that people just hear one side of the story. And so we're thrilled that we have speakers who are willing to be on the podium with people with whom, who they know are going to challenge their remarks. We found lots of speakers and lots of well-regarded individuals that refuse to appear anywhere unless they have a monopoly on the communication. And that is not the kind of environment that we want to promote at Lewis and Clark because we want a lot of independent thinking. One of the things that I want to emphasize is not all of you may agree with everything that either speaker says, but one of the traditions we have at Lewis and Clark is one of civil discourse, where we listen politely and allow views to be presented without interruption, with um, listening carefully to what people say, and then we judge for ourselves what we agree with and what we disagree with. And there'll be a few, full question and answer session where any of you who are in any way annoyed by anything that's said will have a full chance to um, ask questions about it. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you the two uh, co-chairs of this year's symposium, Nathan Romine and Nathan Wren. Thank you. Thanks for that warm reception. <laughs> I'm Nathan Wren. And I'm Nathan Romine. And we're here to welcome you to the 52nd International Affairs Symposium. You're going to hear that a lot. Um, this session is titled Safer Strikes or Strikeouts, the Emergence of Drone Warfare. About three years ago, uh, me and Nathan Wren uh, stepped up here as hosts. And so it's, it's been a, a lovely road to eventually becoming co-chairs and hosting, or not hosting, but being in charge of uh, organizing what I still argue to be the best symposium that you're going to see in the next, or that we have seen in the last four years. I hope that they continue to get better. I also cannot help but reiterate the sentiment that Bob Mandel just spoke to all of you. Uh, civil discourse is integral to the way in which we cultivate leadership on this campus. And so I invite you all to embrace that and listen carefully and closely to each of the speaker's arguments so as to best form your own opinion on those matters discussed here today. Um, tonight's moderator will be Tom Buscelli, the professor of law from our law school. And, uh, for our first host, uh, introducing John Cale Weston is Dina Yazdani. Um, she is an IA major, a junior IA major.
John Cal Weston was the only U.S. State Department official to spend seven years in Iraq and Afghanistan. However, he didn't spend this time in the confines of the Green Zone or in the safety of the U.S. embassies. Instead, he spent his time amongst American Marines, as well as in the company of Iraqi and Afghan civilians. For these reasons, Newsweek magazine has labeled John as a renegade diplomat. His experience and the stories he heard while on the front lines shaped his outlook on American foreign policy and military strategy. After stepping down from his post in the State Department, John became a contributor to the Daily Beast. He's currently writing a book with which he hopes to tell the unsung stories of the Afghans, Iraqis, and American Marines in these war zones. When we had the great opportunity to first meet John, he told Rostam and I that he is here tonight because the Afghans cannot be here and that someone needs to tell the stories of life under drones. Well, John is here for them, and we are extremely grateful to have him. Everyone, please welcome John Cale Weston. I would now like to invite Vincent Singer, a freshman IA major, to come introduce his speaker, a Mr. or General Michael Hayden. Students of Lewis and Clark, as Nathan said, I'd like to welcome you to our 52nd Annual International Affairs Symposium, and I'm very excited to welcome General Michael Hayden. Uh, born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and a proclaimed Steelers fan and season ticket holder, General Hayden began his college career at Duquesne University by walking to school, where he received his BA at, in, in history and his uh, MA in modern American history. Along with his schooling, General Hayden served 39 years with the Air Force, eventually rising to the ranks of four-star general. More, more recently, General Hayden worked as the director of the National Security Agency from 1999 to 2005, following as director of the Central Intelligence Agency from 2006 to 2009. Now General Hayden works as a principal consultant at the Chertoff Group and is a visiting professor at George Mason University. Students, faculty, and attendants, please join me in welcoming General Michael Hayden. Thank you. John, are we ready? We are, General. OK. First of all, let, let me tell you it's an honor to be uh, up here with someone who has sacrificed so much for American security and safety. It's already mentioned in the introduction. You know, John lived with the Marines in Ambar, lived with the Marines in, in Helmand. Uh, he's someone who has actually walked the walk, and I'm just delighted to be up here with him. So thanks, John. I, I would echo that uh, there are tough jobs in government, and you had probably among the most difficult. So I think we come up here to have a respectful and honest and direct debate, so I look forward to it. Yeah, they mentioned civil discourse so many times, I'm getting a little worried. Okay. <laughs> I still have diplomatic immunity, I think. <laughs> okay, well, let's start. We're up here to talk about drones. And, and you know, the first thing I'd, I'd offer is drones are things. Drones don't have value. We infuse things with value by, by the way we use them. And frankly, the things we use reflect the values we have. There's both cause and effect here. So, so what I want to do here uh, tonight, and I'm sure in the Q&A we'll get down to the fine print of tactical use and, 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 and different military tactics and things, but what I want to do here tonight is to put this, this use of drones, and, and by the way, when, I, when we're saying drones here tonight, you know, we're, we're not just talking about taking pictures. All right? We're just not talking about what, what the military calls ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. We're talking about targeted killings. That's really the controversial issue here. So what I want to do is just to put these tools of war into a broader context. And, and since uh, I was taught by the Catholic nuns in grade school and the brothers in high school to begin with an outline and use Roman numerals in the outline, I'm going to tell you what the three Roman numerals are, OK? Mm. Roman numeral one is jus ad bellum, just war. Roman numeral two is jus in bello, justice in war. And Roman numeral three is largely policy, 
It may be right, but is it smart? Okay. So let me start with the U.S. Bellum. Um, I had been director, but is this a just war? I had been director of CIA about a year, and the Germans were in the chair of the European Union. And the German ambassador to the United States, a fellow named Schaderoth, um, would have all the ambassadors from the states of the EU, ambassadors to the United States, over to the German residents for lunch about every two weeks while the Germans were in the chair of the EU. And he would have a, he would have a German come in, or an American come in, and, and kind of be the lunchtime entertainment. And I was selected for, for one of those things. So I'm giving a luncheon talk to all of our good allies in Europe, their ambassadors to the United States. Hey, you know, you're not going to get this opportunity much. Let's commit something interesting here over lunch. Let's just not fill the space with the Chamber of Commerce speech. So I decided, let's talk about renditions, detentions, and interrogations. Okay? <laughs> and about two pages, three pages into my presentation, I had a wonderful staff at CIA, and they prepared speeches, but, you know, the greatest temptation of man isn't sex. It's fooling around with someone else's prose, okay? <laughs> and, and I always fooled around with prose, but this speech, I, I, took, I, I took an awful lot of time because I thought it was very important. And I still remember what I said on page two or three of the speech. I said, hey, look, let, 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 me, let me just be, get a card straight up. We're all friends here, right? Let me tell you what I believe, my agency believes, my government believes, and what I believe the people of my nation believe. We are a nation at war. We are at war with Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. This war is global in scope, and I can only fulfill my moral responsibilities to my citizens by taking this fight to that enemy wherever they may be. Four sentences. War, Al-Qaeda, global, take the fight. No one else in the room agreed with any of those four sentences. Not only did they think it illegitimate for themselves to think it, they didn't think it was legitimate for the United States to think it. We have a very unique view of this war. War. It's one with which I am obviously quite comfortable. It is also one with which the last two presidents of these United States have been quite comfortable. There has been no change in that broad embrace. We are a nation at war with Al Qaeda in a, in a global conflict. Okay. Let's take one of the great accomplishments of that war: the killing of Osama bin Laden. What now? Three years ago at Abbottabad. About? I mean, a wonderful achievement of American intelligence and American arms. Let me just describe it for you in a slightly different way. Heavily armed agents of the United States government, when confronting an unarmed man offering no visible resistance, gunned him down. Now, if you don't accept my original premise, we are a nation at war, there are other English language words to describe what happened at Abbottabad and they're mostly in the criminal statutes. In other words, we believe we're at war. Now, this is a peculiar war. It's a very different kind of war. Our enemy, for example, our enemy rejects Geneva. Look, look, the core of Geneva, the core of Geneva is the distinction between combatant and non-combatant. Our enemy rejects that not only for his victims, he rejects that for himself, believing that all adherents of Al-Qaeda are warriors for the cause. Now, if the enemy rejects Geneva, there might be a case that we're nibbling at the edges of Westphalia. You know, the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 that established the nation state system and kind of enshrined state sovereignty as the, as the keystone of all international relations. Um, you know, we're nibbling on that when our president, both presidents, have talked about taking unilateral action in countries who are either unable or unwilling to take action against those who would will you and me harm. Now, by the way, before you think this nibbling at Westphalia is a totally right-wing phenomenon, you know, it's, it's done by those people who in the armed forces or in the power ministries of the United States, uh, those on the left who fervently support the principle of R2P, responsibility to protect, they also are gnawing away at the traditional concept of sovereignty too. They believe they have the right 
to actively intervene. And finally, before you think this nibbling at Westphalia is an, a totally American phenomenon, birthed out of American exceptionalism or American arrogance, let me remind you that one of the most celebrated st stories of Western arms in the history of Western civilization was the story of the Royal Navy, the last great global hegemon, who for the first half of the 19th century trampled over the sovereignty of just about everyone, stamping out the global slave trade. So, first point, just war. Second point, justice in war. Even if your cause is righteous, there are certain laws of armed conflict that you have to follow. Principles of necessity, humanity, distinction, proportionality, necessity. It has to be done. There's a military compellence. Humanity, it's, it's done in a way that does not shock the conscience. Distinction, the enemy and the innocent. And finally, proportionality. That the good that comes from your action outweighs the evil you may intentionally or unintentionally cause. Let me talk and really drill down on the question of necessity. I was director of CIA from May of 2006 to February of 2009. Uh, beginning in 06, really developing in 07, Al Qaeda began to reestablish safe havens in the tribal region of Pakistan. They were in no way the size of what we had seen in Afghanistan prior to 9-11, but they were beginning to resemble that safe haven in quality, if not in quantity. We saw a large number of Westerners uh, going to these safe havens and being trained. Westerners, the way we described it to the president, Westerners who would not cause you to raise an eyebrow, were they, <clears throat> were they standing next to you in the passport line, say, at, at Dulles or, or at LAX? We try to take action against these folks in, in 07. Um, we gave ourselves a mark of 0 for 07 in terms of taking terrorists off the battlefield in these structures, in these graduating classes, who we viewed were of great threat, not just to Afghanistan, not just to Pakistan, but of threats to the homeland. We never said this to the president, the sense I'm gonna give you now, all right? <clears throat> It would have been unfair to say it to the president. But if you kind of boiled everything we said to him over a six month period and distilled it down to a really core essence, what I'm gonna tell you now is what we told him over that six months. Mr. President, knowing what it is we know now, there is no explaining our inaction after the next successful attack. And beginning in July of 2008, the United States began a program of targeted killings against Al Qaeda in the tribal region of Pakistan, <clears throat> a program, frankly, that was heartily embraced by the new administration in January of 2009. Necessity. What about precision and proportionality? And I know John's gonna talk about collateral damage and civilian casualties, and we ought to, because we all have to have a conscience well, when we do these kinds of things. But let me tell you the actual concrete way drones fight as opposed to other forms of conflict. Um, and I'm speaking here now, not really as director of CIA, but as, as Vincent said, someone who's been in the Air Force for 39 years. <clears throat> A drone gives you an almost unblinking stare at the target. And so if you're called up, if you're, de you're the decision maker when it comes when it comes to a targeted strike. Uh, you're called up, we've, we think, sir, we've got a good strike, it's this compound here, and you get to ask questions. <clears throat> you get to say, how long have you had capture of the target? Which is not a question you get to ask if, an, if it's an F-16 or an F-15 that's carrying your weapons. How long have you had capture of the target? How long have you been looking at this thing? <clears throat> What's the historical record of the target? Give me everything you have on this target. When was the last time you saw someone at this target who was not a military age male? Have you seen anyone at this target who was not a military age male in the current circumstance? <clears throat> what are you seeing in the living quarters? Do you see smoke coming out of the chimney? Is there a fire in the fireplace? Do you believe that there are civilians in the living quarters? Hmm, okay. How's the weather? Very good. How's the fuel? We got another one coming in to back up the one we've got on orbit now. 
Okay, call me in three hours. They call you back in three hours. How long have you had capture of the target? Have you seen anybody who's not? And then you're getting close to making a decision. And then you get to say, hmm, show me a hellfire coming in from the northwest. And they get actually to draw the weapon coming in from the northwest. And, and forgive me for, for being blunt, they draw for you what they call a bug splat. It just looks like a big critter hit your windscreen driving down your interstate here. In the middle of that splat is kind of red, and then around it is kind of yellow, <clears throat> and then around that is kind of green. I mean, that's the art and science of, of weapons engineers, knowing that at that altitude, from that direction, against this target, red is lethal, yellow is wounding, green is not. And then you get to say, I don't like it from the Northwest. There's too much energy from the, from the strike heading towards the living quarters. Show me a look from the Northeast. And they do that. Yeah, I like that better. Any excess energy from the strike, since it's coming from the Northeast, and I know it's a more difficult shot, show, throws the energy against that wall and the stockade and away from the family quarters, and you get, you get to make a decision. Now, mistakes are made. You may object to doing this in the first place. I get it. But it's rare that someone who's applying violence on your behalf gets to apply it with such patience and with such precision. So I actually think it's a just war, and I actually think the use of these weapons in this war is also just. But it doesn't always mean that it's smart. Things change. About a year ago, Stan McChrystal, okay, former commander of Joint Special Operations Command, and Mike Hayden, that's me, we were on Candy Crowley's show, State of the Union. You probably couldn't get two retired four stars with more drones in their record than Hayden and McChrystal. And Candy asked us both, what about this? There's lots of discussion now about the use of targeted killings and doing it from unmanned aerial vehicles. And both Stanley and I said, well, you know, things change. Things that may have been appropriate back in 07, remember my description, 0 for 07, remember my description, training camps, graduating Westerners, remember my description about no explaining in the next attack on the homeland? <clears throat> if those conditions no longer pertain in 2011 or 2012, it allows you to make some other decisions. Hey, look, we always knew that when you used a weapon like this, you had a primary effect a very bad man is no longer able to hurt you. But there were second and third order effects as well. A powerful second order effect is that it alienated our allies. Remember, back to the definition of war, remember lunch at the German embassy, my talking to all of our European friends and none of them agreeing with our theory of war. There was a, there was a strike, <clears throat> done, actually done by, by Navy SEALs, in September of 2009 in Somalia. It was, a, it was against a fellow named Salah Nabhan, who was the operations chief for, for Al-Shabaab, the Al-Qaeda affiliate uh, in Somalia. SEALs never dismounted. They had good intelligence. They knew where he would be. It was kind of a two-car convoy. The SEALs used organic weapons aboard their gunships, aboard the helicopters, <clears throat> sprayed the sprayed the column, landed long enough just to swab up enough of Salah Nabhan so they'd have DNA to prove that that was him who they had killed, and off they went. There isn't a country in Europe who would have given the United States intelligence if they thought it would have been used for that purpose. It would have been a violation of their domestic law. So although I'm saying, hey, this is really good, we're taking terrorists off the battlefield, I know there are other stress points. I know, for example, that the more we do this, the more we create daylight between ourselves and some of our good friends, who will admit privately that those people we kill also make them safe too. There's a third element too. These kinds of killings, particularly if they involved any real or alleged collateral damage, serve as a recruitment tool for our enemy. They can use it uh, for their own purposes to sustain the jihad, to sustain their recruitment. So, so we always knew that there were second and third order effects that were negative. But we also believe that that first order effect is really important too. 
And there are times when that first order effect is so powerful that you kind of eat the losses from the second and, and tertiary effect. I'll offer one other thought too. Targeted killing is not a substitute for strategy. Targeted killing must be an integral part of strategy. I was actually President Obama's CIA chief for three weeks, <laughs> waiting for Leon Panetta to get confirmed. And we had a successful operational act. It's the most I can tell you in this audience. And, the, um, and I was down in the White House Situation Room, and I said, well, you know, um, yada, 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 and we did that, <laughs> okay? And, and we got all done, and I'm about ready to leave, and I'm grabbing my portfolio here, and, and, and I get poked in the back. I turn around, it's Rahm Emanuel, okay? And, and, and Rahm Emanuel says, hey, John, I just want to, I just want to say, say to you, that's really, really good stuff. Now, I should have, knowing Rahm Emanuel's personality, said, Rahm Emanuel just said something nice. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on moving. <laughs> But I didn't, because I knew I'd never have another chance to talk to him again. And I said, Rom, thanks. That's very kind. Good people, working very hard. But you realize that was just a counterterrorism success. Unless you change the facts on the ground, you get to do that forever. In other words, these strikes can buy you time, but they can't be all you have. And I think they're quite legitimate for buying you time. I think they're moral in a moral war, and there are circumstances where their use is not just allowable, their use is compelled. I was on a panel with uh, Richard Haas, uh, head of the Council on Foreign Relations. We were on one of those Fareed Zakaria things. And by the way, this is a perennial. This topic has been coming up over years. And about a year or so ago, we're doing this with, with Fareed, and Richard, Richard summarized it better than I ever could, so I am I'm shamelessly taking Richard's final comment. What he said was, for Reed, when it comes to drones and targeted killings, what we're looking for here is not a switch. What we need is a dial. What we need is a dial. Thank you all very much. General Hayden, I, I just want to repeat that uh, I've been looking forward to debating you for a long time, and that means because of all the experience you bring to the issue, it's, a, it's uh, I think for all of you in the audience, it's rare, I think, that people from Washington sometimes fly all the way west to engage on some pretty hot topics, and he deserves a lot of credit for that. However, comma, however, um, <laughs> that doesn't mean we're going to be direct and honest and have a good debate, and that's why I'm here. And, I'm shameless when it comes to trying to re-engage sort of that conscience question that you talked about. I also wanted to start by uh, looking a bit at the words we used after September 11, 2001. I know most of you students, and I should say thank you to the organizing committee, to Dina and Rostam, to Nathan Squared, wherever you are, uh, <laughs> and President Glasner and the whole university community. I, I, I find therapy post-war is best practice among university students. So when my book is out, any university out there, please invite me. Um, but, but back to the issue at hand. Um, words became a tactic and part of the strategy. September 11th happened. Most of you were in grade school, which is hard to believe. Um, and our government started to talk in a certain way, which was very interesting to my ears inside. But again, I think more importantly for the rest of the world, whether it's the Europeans, whether it's the Afghans, whether it's the German chancellor, to be frank, whether it's the Brazilians. And I just want to repeat some of those words. And you, you raised a couple that I'm now going to add. Bug splat is one. I will never talk about a human life as a bug splat, ever. Um, whether our analysts do that is something else. But when you've seen bug splats in the form of kids and women and, to, to be frank, collateral damage, I just that really, I think, is part of the problem. But let me, let me read through some of these words, because I think as I make my case, these are the words I, I hopefully want us to, to focus on. Um, these are words that I believe were used to confuse the national conscience. And I think that's not American, and I think it's dangerous. And now we're having a debate, but it's a debate that became um, 
bipartisan, you're right, both presidents, um, became part of the game in Washington versus the discussion that we needed to have inside our government as well as with the rest of the world. So some of these words, um, black sites, I'll just throw them out there. I don't have a dictionary, I'm not gonna read the definition, but as educated students, if you don't know what it means, look it up. Black sites, rendition, unlawful enemy combatants, enhanced interrogation techniques, MAMs, military aged males. I used to tell the Marine Generals in Fallujah that at that point in my youth, I technically qualified as a military aged male. <laughs> I'm a bit older now, but it really rubbed me the wrong way because if I were an Iraqi kid in Fallujah or Ramadi, wherever I lived for three years, if the first assessment, and the Marines were my, basically on the same side of me on this, if our first assessment was threat, 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 Colonel, you know what I'm talking about, they're MAMs, they're MAMs. That's not a fair representation of the communities we were dealing with. It's much easier to bug splat a MAM than to kill an Iraqi insurgent who's actually just pissed that he's got Marine tanks on his, on his main street. Um, so that's another word. Um, and to be frank, the one that bothers me the most is enhanced interrogation techniques. What happened was waterboarding, and waterboarding is torture. Why we don't want to call it torture is because under international law, we're obligated to do certain things if we talk about torture. Way above my pay grade, but not above my pay grade as a citizen. Those are the words I think we need to, to keep in mind as we talk about drones, because drones falls into that issue of how do we describe a tactic that in my view really subverted the strategy. UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. To, to your credit, General, you talked about their arm, their Hellfire missiles, there's Predator, there's all these crazy names that are very macho sounding. And, and they sell really well in the Pentagon. Um, they, they helped protect some of my Marines, they helped protect me. I'm not here to say that, that they didn't always have a use. But it's the language that we've used that I think has become a fundamental part of the problem here. And I do think it should be an emotional debate. I think it should be a debate that we actually do get fairly angry about if we think about some of the things that, that have happened. My perspective, and this is already highlighted in my intro, and as the general talked about, is this. This is the Marine boonie hat given to me by a bunch of Marines, and this is a, a rusty tea kettle from a place called Musakel District in Host Province. So for better or for worse, that's my experience and that's the perspective I'm bringing to the debate tonight. I do think that whether we're talking to the EU ambassadors in Washington or in the NSC or in the principals uh, debating chambers, what we often don't think about is the other, the them, the anthropologist in me is always thinking, how does this resonate or not resonate with the people who are our best ambassadors? And I, to be honest, don't think they're American. I think they're the next generation in all parts of the world. Um, and, and that's kind of the background I bring. On the specific issue of drones, I'm gonna divide the 15 minutes or so I've got left into five main sections, but before I do that, I just wanna ask a couple questions to the audience. Are any of you veterans? Any Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine? Okay, I hope you weigh in on this debate as well because I'm a big believer, and if you've been in these wars, you've seen a lot, hopefully you'll stand up and let us know what you think. You can agree, agree or disagree with me 100%, but thank you for what you did. I think the policy didn't match the sacrifice, but thank you for, for coming back and being part of the, uh, of the debate. The second um, question I wanna get to is what I ask a lot of groups when I, I meet them. After basically 13 years of constant war, and the way I heard you is it was almost like this constant war is constant because the enemy and the threat always has to be pushed. And I guess that's part of the language, I think, that didn't resonate among the Afghans and the Iraqis that I dealt with over seven years. That we treated this war as a, we've got to take the fight to them. And at some level, we did. But where that line was crossed, I think, is where we'll have, I think, a pretty healthy exchange. So the question I ask is, is two parts. The first is, what adjectives or words do you associate with the United States of America? First things that come to mind. You don't have to pull out a piece of paper, but you're smart students, keep it up in your head. What are the two or three words when I say US of A, America, United States, what comes to mind? The second question I want you to think about is if I were to ask that question to Iraqis, Afghans, Brazilians, Germans, Yemenis, what words would they 
put on the top of that list. So we're clear on that pop quiz? So I'm gonna come back to it. My mother was a fifth grade school teacher, so she taught me the value of a pop quiz. Um, so the five areas now I, I wanna get into um, are first, that question, so please think about it a bit. I'm gonna do a little bit on the background of drones because I, you, I think, raised some interesting big picture questions. I wanna uh, dive a little bit deeper on some specifics on the drones. The third would be a couple of experiences I had, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan that I think get to sort of the, the debate topic. The fourth would be, and I, I'm glad you confessed to the Crowley and McChrystal, because I, I, I agree with you when you said that it's a lot more complicated than, than perhaps either you had been labeled as, as advocating or that the, the facts really show. Um, but I, I love another quote by General McChrystal, which I'll, I'll, I want to bring into the discussion. Uh, and then finally, and really most importantly, I'm going to end um, with the voice from over there. Because I doubt we have any Afghans, Iraqis, Yemenis, Somalis in the room, do we? Do we have any Afghan Americans, Iraqi Americans? Anyone who doesn't carry a US passport? Okay, a few, good. So please also ask some questions because after the last debate I had in New York with an admiral and a general, we quote lost the debate, but a Saudi came up to me 12 years after 9-11 and said, thank you. And I said, well, you know, we lost, but what do you mean? He said, you know, thank you for, for trying to advocate what we, what we see and how we view this issue. The irony was, of course, most of, those, most of those hijackers were Saudi. So again, as we get wrapped up in our own dialogue, our own words, our own exchange, fundamentally my bias and my perspective is gonna be, how does it sound, how does it resonate, or how does it not res resonate among non-Americans. Not excusing the fact that you had a very tough job briefing presidents and Washington BS and politics and all that. Um, so to the issue of, of you know, the background on drones, when do you think the high point of drones use was, was occurring? This is also a bit of a trick question. Which president has ordered more drone strikes? Anyone, just yell. Obama. So it's a bipartisan issue. It's not like you know, General Hayden, who's worked more on the Republican side, that he's right. Both presidents have had a very big role in giving him direction and people lower on the food chain like me in the State Department what our policy is. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, if you look at some of the, the charts, and again, I'm not here with a PowerPoint, if 2009 and 2010, and again, General, you would know better than I, but it seems that was the high. Uh, and, and it's broken down in terms of Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya. The NSA may watch you when you go to this website, but go to Living Under the Drones, and it's actually a very valuable website. It'll give you the other side of the story. I violated enough rules that I'm sure I'm on the grid. But go to Living Under the Drones, and you'll get a very helpful counter to what I used to do, which is provide official analysis. And you should go to the CIA website, you should go to the official website, go to both, and then make your own decisions. So it's livingunderthedrones.com. Um, and I probably, the NSA is probably okay with it, but I'm not sure. Um, and then, you know, that third question that I'm gonna move into is how did this drone policy really um, come to me in both wars? I'd like to stand up here and say that that tactic that did, as you rightly say, sort of have to be looked at, was it a strategy that was supporting our overall goal, working or not? When I first arrived in Fallujah, uh, had no idea what I was getting into. General Conway was the first general I worked with, amazing Marine leader. Um, the drones that were flying overhead were unarmed. They were eyes primarily. Worked really well for Marines. I mean, we, they sounded like flying lawnmowers. Um, annoying, but you know, it wasn't like the Iraqis at the time were fearful that a Hellfire missile was gonna drop into the middle of Fallujah. Fallujah being the biggest battle of the Iraq war, it was full of a lot of bad people, including a guy named Zarqawi, who was later killed, fortunately, in another part of the country. He's one man I would say a bug splat fit, but that's about it. Um, so at that point in Fallujah, it was aerial, the women would look up, the leaders used to tell me, this is not going over so well. And I said, well, you know, it's eyes, it's, we're trying to help you rebuild the city. And I said, well, they think you're spying on them when they're hanging up the clothes. And there was the friction that was starting in that city. When I got to Afghanistan in the eastern part in a place called Host, which unlike Fallujah had everything to do with 9-11, a guy named, um, 
uh, Muhammad Atta spent some time there, and uh, you're probably too young, some of you, to know what that name means, which is hard to believe, but he was one of the pilots uh, that hit the Twin Towers in New York. And as a former New Yorker for a few years, you know, that piece of terrain and that opening act is very near and dear to me as well. Um, so after four years in Fallujah, I finally, you know, Ambassador Newman and others come to Afghanistan, go to East, it's a tough area. Didn't do my homework, to be frank, kind of went in fairly naive, but learned a lot real quickly. In host, the drones then, of course, in Miram Shah and over the border in the tribal region, CIA primarily, uh, became a very live issue for me. And at that point, it was more, of course, than just eyes and ears. It was the hellfires. It was the, the kinetic, as we call it, the, 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 the targeting. I was not, you know, emailing Nellis Air Force Base or Langley or wherever, you know, involved in the targeting. But what, what my role was was what happens after. And a lot of those hosties uh, had cousins, brothers, everyone over in the madrasas in Miram Shah or uh, tribal members. So as a very neutral, objective guy, I wanted to understand what the pros and cons were, and I did not go into that job hating drones. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I did not go in with an agenda to say that, you know, we're screwing ourselves by, to be frank, uh, a strategy that's just not working. But over time, it became very clear um, that the strategic effect was creating more enemies than we were killing. And you gotta look at it that way, I think, which is if your cousin is Taliban, or if your cousin is even over on the further dark side over Al Qaeda, and he lives three or four clicks or a distance down the road, and General Hayden and his team, with constant eyes, determine that's a legitimate hit, some of the specifics we need to talk about. What was happening wasn't just that the first hit happened. Sometimes there were second and third hits. And I'll let you maybe address that. So the way strikes were being done raised a whole host of questions in my mind. I had all the clearances um, about the initial versus the second versus the third. So if you're, quote, the target, and then people run to the target, why is the second missile dropped, and is that actually legal, I would say. There's a whole legal issue, which I'm not here to talk about, but that's something we should put into the frame. And then there's just, is it smart? And I'm, I'm glad you raised that, because it sounds like we sort of agree that, it, that I would say sooner it wasn't smart. It seems like you came around to that it wasn't smart, whether it was with the allies or whether it was just the, the net of the second or third order effects. The second or third order effects are dead civilians, too. Um, so that's when I got to be a bit more personal and, 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 and experienced with drones, is what happened after the target. Uh, but Fallujah was just the eyes and ears. And I have to say, that's probably where, if it had stayed mostly that, I can see the huge strategic advantage. All the generals I worked with, the freaking company commanders, battalion commanders, regimental commanders, we we're all trying to live in Iraq. For you Marines or soldiers out there, if you were there, you know how hard that was. So I'm not saying that there wasn't a value for that. It's when we started to use the language that really blurred some fundamental lines about, I think, what we represent to the world that I really started to have some questions, I think, that were backed up by experience. The words that we call these weapons, Reaper, Predator, Hunter, Shadow, sounds great inside the Beltway. Sell for a lot of money. All of my Marine friends, you know, it's tough macho language. But is that really the language we should be focused on? Is that really the audience we should be focused on, which is each other? If I'm an Afghan parent, and I mean, I'll use an example of a Yemeni. He testified in Washington that the word on the street in Yemen is, you know, parents tell their kids, you know, go to bed or the drones will be after you. I mean, it's kind of funny, but it's kind of sad. I mean, really, that, 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 that our export in the air you know, is kind of becoming like the boogeyman, you know, you better go to bed or, you know, that American drone is gonna drop the bomb here. That's all on the record, it's all in congressional testimony. You ought to, when you're bored on a Friday night, look it up. Um, seriously, this is the role of citizens. Uh, the debate has started, it started too late, but it's good that the general's here, to his credit, to engage in it. Um, those are words that, that are loaded, and they're loaded especially for, for, uh, for non-Americans. The story I want to get to before I close here, how much, I got about 10 minutes? How much? Oh, wow, okay. I'm gonna fast forward to um, the voices from over there, because the McChrystal quote, I think, you know, you 
confess that you both kind of came around on that, and I think that's that's laudable that, that, that two generals weren't so vested in a strategy that they were like, we we're always right. Um, they saw, especially I know General McChrystal when I was over there. So the voice of the Afghans is what I'm going to read you now, and then I'm going to end sort of on a more positive note, because the American effort after 9-11 has not been all bloodshed and, 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 and mistakes. It actually has translated in some things that we can still feel okay about, even though we need this debate. The first uh, examples are from Times Square on May 1st, 2010, and the second is the Boston Marathon bombing. Faisal Shahzad, uh, who tried to blow up his P Nissan Pathfinder uh, between 45th and 7th Avenue, three 20-gallon propane tanks, a, a big green metal gun locker. Luckily, he was kind of a half-assed terrorist, didn't work, no one was hurt. But what he said when he was asked was, well, the drones hit in Afghanistan and Iraq, he told the judge, they don't see children, you're right, you've admitted that. They don't see anybody. They kill women, children, they kill everybody. It's a war, and in war they kill people, they're killing all Muslims. He may have had 20 other reasons to do it, but he specifically talked about drones. That's, to me, fact, and that's evidence. I'm not gonna get into a debate about what other uh, motivated him. The Boston Marathon bombing on April 15, 2013, Sarnayev said this, the U.S. government is killing our innocent civilians. I can't stand to see such evil go unpunished. We Muslims are one body. You hurt one, you hurt us all. Stop killing our innocent people and we will stop. Again, those are his own words. I try and just sometimes be the messenger. Back to the question I asked you at the beginning. What words do you associate with the United States of America? Democracy, freedom, rule of law, I'm just guessing. Beyonce, I don't know. Um, Twitter, probably. W more importantly, what words do you think the Afghans and the Iraqis said they associate with the United States of America? And I'll let you think about that for a while. Unfortunately, it was not what we wanted it to be. I was once in a meeting with General Mattis, and we had a very interesting discussion about this. He, as a former CENTCOM commander, went all around the world, and I said, what are you hearing? And I said, yeah, unfortunately, I was hearing the same thing on the ground. I wish I had more time to talk about what the Afghans have sent me. Um, it, it, each drone strike gives birth to a suicide bomber is one. That came on April 4th from Host Province. Another one said, as for Afghanistan, drone strikes are viewed as, quote, unclean war, um, et cetera. And I can you know, tell you later on. But I want to end in my half minute, and I'm going to follow the rules, um, is an email I got uh, when Neil Armstrong passed away. We all know who Neil Armstrong is, I hope. <laughs> who, okay, I'm not gonna ask, because you should be embarrassed. If you don't know, he went to the moon. <laughs> he landed on the moon. So I'm sitting in probably DC, not liking it. I think I was there at the time, although it's all a blur now, but I get an email in my inbox, and it's not from any American member of my family or a Marine friend or an ambassador who I used to work for, none of that. It comes from Jalalabad, and it's Jalalabad where SEAL Team 6 launched from to get Mr. Osama bin Laden. So you, I think, threw a red herring out there with Osama bin Laden. I'll call it how I saw it. We spent a lot of time talking about Osama bin Laden, but what drones really are about is not Osama bin Laden. Um, so the email I got from uh, this Afghan who I met in host uh, said this, and I'm going to read it verbatim. Uh, so sad about the death of Neil Armstrong. He was the real pointer who had shown his hero heroism and persuade human to seek and try more and has made clear that nothing is impassable. It's not impossible. He actually says impassable, which is even better prose. Um, and what I thought is, wow, here's a kid in Jalalabad, which is strategic terrain where we need to have overwatch into a nuclear Pakistan. He's looking up at the moon thinking that country sent someone to the moon. But unfortunately, and I come here to you honestly, He's also now probably thinking more about drones than about Neil Armstrong. And that is where the, narr the story of America, I think, has been um, twisted in a way that it didn't need to be. And it's bipartisan. It's not Senator Feinstein or Senator Schmo. It's everyone. And we as citizens need to look in the mirror and be honest and see where the cracks are and have the kind of debate that Lewis and Clark is sponsoring. And I hope you have more. You should invite more of the Washington people and more of the rebels, and we'll come together, and we'll have a good debate, and it's healthy. So thank you.
Well, I don't really think I have anything to do. You obviously both <laughs> completely agree on everything. Um, do you agree with both of us? <laughs> oh. So um, I, we definitely heard some debate and some dispute about language, but I think I want to start with, I'm not sure where the dispute ended as far as substance. Um, so I think that's one thing I want to start talking about. Although, uh, General, first I wanted to talk to you about, do you really think it's time to get rid of Roethlisberger? <laughs> no, not at all. Okay, okay. Well, I guess that's a different debate we should have. Um, uh, Mr. West, I'm going to start with you. Um, you obviously have a lot of problems with the language that was used by the general and by other supporters of drone strikes. But it, it was less clear to me where you draw the line in terms of substance in using drones. Do you sure, I, I want to clarify. Drones? Yeah, I, I tried to say that in Fallujah when it was eyes before the, the hellfire direct targeting, there is value on a battlefield um, that will save American lives, and that's our job in government. I mean, to the general's credit, you know, I'm paid to first and foremost represent the United States of America. I'm not paid to represent Sweden. Um, but I do know that we're generally safer when we have the world with us on issues. So my line, and I'm glad you asked it because I want to be clear, I think was crossed when the debate was not happening, honestly, I think, at high levels, because the language was being used to sort of confuse what was really going on. And the judges, the, the courts that are now involved in all these issues are, are sort of having some interesting votes on this. And then secondly, I think the American people, and to the credit of Lewis and Clark, are starting to have a vote on this. So when I was in Afghanistan and the bug splats were human beings that were at a wedding party, that's when, to me, it was a fundamentally different equation uh, than uh, what we were seeing in Fallujah. So I would draw the line between the early use of drones and then when drones became, in my view, the joystick effect of war. One of the Afghans sent me an email and said, it's like joystick war. And in a way, then that becomes easier for the American people to be like, well, it's a video game. Uh, did that answer? Yes. Okay. Um, General, uh, Mr. Weston had quite a bit to say about euphemisms and a lot of the language that was used both by you and other supporters of drone strikes. Do you agree that that's part of the problem? I don't know if they're euphemisms or the terms we use. They're, they're shorthand. I use bug splat, and you can probably tell I used it for a purpose. I, I wanted to be very candid. Now, it's not quite as John described. Bug splat is a computer-generated image that gives you predictability as to lethality and non-lethality of a strike with a certain weapon at a certain space from a certain, certain direction. But I, but I did want it to be very candid with you so that you, you, you understand. Uh, that this stuff really goes on. Let, let me pick the video game up, mm -hmm. because I think that might be useful for this. Um, I actually think, in fact, my, my, my real life experience is that the, the video game problem uh, is, is, is not creating inhumanity in the people actually doing this. In fact, I, I see quite the opposite. Right. I mean, when you're, you're looking at a compound yeah, yeah. For, for, for eight hours, you get to know the people. Uh, you know, and there is a psychic impact saying, wait till he gets in the car, then launch the hellfire. I mean, this is a guy who was kissing his wife and kids goodbye. And you waited until he got clear of the family. So I'm not particularly worried about the warrior in terms of the video game effect. And I guess it wouldn't be called the video game effect, but it's the easy policy option effect. Hmm. Okay? It's not the warrior level. It's the policymaker level. This is easy to do. And you don't have to go to Dover to meet any caskets coming home when you implement this policy. Now, that is not me saying hmm. that the only honorable American way of war is to put Americans at risk. In fact, that's a, that's a horrible thing to even think. But we do have to guard against this being too fast an option for a political leader who needs to be seen as doing something but doesn't want to double down and put his personal or political prestige at risk when it comes to casualties. Mr. Weston, are, are we engaged in a just war? The general quite clearly <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was going to come back on the, the three Roman numerals that the general raised because I found it to be an interesting way of looking um, at the issue. I mean, my brother had sent me stuff about just war, and I wish I'd read it, because at some <laughs> level it was you know, very uh, ethereal. And I, and I, but I think it's, it's important when you break it down. 
I don't think it's just war because I guess the one that, that really jumps out for me is it's smart, and I'm very operational and practical, which is, you know, are we pursuing strategies that fundamentally make it safer for Oregonians? My sister lived here for a while. I was a student up in the Seattle area. I mean, is it safer for uh, us when we do this? And then um, equally important, you know, are we, are we doing something that is in the long traditions of the United States of America? And I did intentionally open this tonight because I don't think isolated in a way UAVs or drones isn't tied to a lot of issues that the general and I, especially he has worked on, about warfare after 9-11. So just war for me, I studied international relations as a wannabe State Department guy for a long time. I then found myself in the middle of insurgencies and counterinsurgencies, which is the good colonel here has written good books about. But I guess how I look at it is, I believe the Americans want to be the good guys. And when we start to do things that make us the bad guys, for honest reasons, we need to look hard at, at, at why. And that's that question I asked you about the words we believe we represent after 13 years of war. And I don't think it's constant. And then what, more importantly, the Iraqis, the Afghans, the Yemenis maybe associate with us. And unfortunately, at the top of that list, when I would ask, um, drones would be a lot higher than Twitter or democracy. And that's the problem I have, is I want more Jamshids to look up and think there's a country that went to the moon that showed a lot's possible rather than there's a country uh, that may keep my kids up or that may kill grandma because she's in a wedding party. And that's where I think we cross the line. So no, it wasn't just when we cross that line. General, this will be my last question, then we'll start taking some questions from the audience. Um, you specifically acknowledge that absent war some of the things that we're doing would be criminal acts. Yeah. Um, and you also acknowledged that uh, unless we change the effects on the ground, we could be doing this forever. But what I didn't hear was when does this war end and how do we know it's yeah. over? Yeah, and, and uh, let me give you the, the, the classic intelligence officer's answer to, the, to a tough question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, that, and that is a very difficult thing. I, I, I did this at the University of Michigan about two or three 9-11s ago. And I put my left arm out here and said, this is all we're doing now and all that big stuff, World Trade Center 1, 9-11, ain't going to happen. We're, we're actually pretty good at this. But now we get the drive-by shooting. We get Fazal Shahzad. We get Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib. We, 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 we get Fort Hood. And then, and then I say to the audience, so uh, what do you want me to do with my left arm? You know, how, you, know you want me to, to kind of do a little more for you here? And as a citizen, my answer is, hell no. All right? But you get to vote on that, too. But then I, I stopped in the conversations. Oh, by the way, if you don't want me to lower my arm to squeeze your privacy, or your commerce, or your convenience anymore, when is it you want me to raise my left arm? And here we're not just talking about drones. We're talking about TSA. We're, 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 we're talking about uh, our student visa program. We're, I mean, it, it's everything that we are now more willing to, to embrace risk. And, and unfortunately, and I, I think John brings up a very good problem, um, our political structure, all the incentives in our political structure are wired to keep my left arm where it is and not to move it because if you move it up, you know, you know what I mean by moving up, right? You're, you're less aggressive, you're less comprehensive and so on. Um, whoever decides to do that, you know, the first, first thing that goes bump in the night is a political disaster for that individual. So it's a, it's do you mind, deep. Mr. Moderator, I forget, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Uh, Professor Tom, uh, no. Uh, you shall. You shall. Um, do you mind if I, General, do you mind if I follow up a little bit? And then I'll follow you know, up. It's an honor, again, it is an honor to have someone like you come to an environment like this. You know Lewis and Clark isn't Texas A&M. I mean, I, I, I respect that. Nothing against Texas A&M. Clearly, clearly not. <laughs> I, I have a lot of friends at A&M, too. But, but I guess the question I have for you is where did you see moral courage at the highest levels of our government along the way? Not just when it was easy, maybe, and the debate had shifted. Where did you see examples of moral courage? And I hope you're willing to share. And then secondly, is the, are there decisions you would have done differently now that you look back? And you were in such key jobs with huge political pressure. I'm going to defend him a little bit. President of the United States gets elected. What's his number one job? Protect the American people. His CIA director, his NSA, he has a big job. There's a big haystack. But that doesn't excuse transparency and accountability. So on those two questions, um, where was moral courage? And would you have done something differently in hindsight? 
Two things, that's probably not the answer you wanted, but I actually saw George Bush display moral courage, doing things that had no political upside and actually put him at political risk in, in order to keep the country safe, and his only motivation was keeping the country safe. Right, and I'm, I'm really talking about terrorist surveillance program and, and things like that. Politically, there, that is not a winning hand. You're, the warrantless wiretapping? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now, that's something we should talk about. We're gonna get the world hunger by 10, so <laughs> stand by. I mean, General, General, a warrantless wiretapping is worth a few questions, I think. <laughs> um, what I would have done different is I, I would have been so full Monty to the American Congress mm about what it was we were doing, that it would have been embarrassing to conduct the briefing. Interesting. And to, to you know, I remember I said candid, bug splat, let me, let, me, let me go slightly coarse again, right? I'd have made them so pregnant with the information about what it is their government was doing to defend them, that when the New York Times ran the story, there would be no doubt by any member of the American citizenry who was with child. Hmm. Right? And that, that would have forced the second political branch, or actually the first political branch, because it's Article One. that would have forced the first political branch to man up at the beginning when, when all was doubt and all was danger and participate in the decision making. That's what I would have done differently. Fair enough. I think Senator Feinstein will like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I, need, I promised, since I yielded some of my time, I'm going to come back. There, there's, there's an important issue here, um, obviously. Um, more globally, Brent Scowcroft wrote an article two years ago now, in which Brent said, you know, when I was doing my thing, everything I cared about was a nation state, and the way I moved them on the board was hard power. And, and Brent, you know, remember, okay, Brent Scowcroft, twice National Security Advisor, Ford, 41, Bush, all right. Uh, he says neither of those two sentences is true. Uh, the great post-industrial era, the age of globalization, of which the web is an example, but not the only thing, has, has pushed power down, which is wonderful for you and me. I, I tell public audiences when I give speeches now, you know, I'm old enough to remember I used to get in the car, drive to a building, and talk to a person in order to get my money. There's probably no one in this room who's had that experience, okay? Power is pushed down to do good. Power is pushed down to do evil. I'm also old enough to remember when I didn't lose any sleep over a religious fanatic in the cave in the Hindu Kush. But the new world, not the world of, it was the ambient background when Geneva or Westphalia was written, but the world we're in now is the power to do you harm is now in the person of sub-state and even individual actors. And many of these actors, many of these actors choose to plot plan and, and, and seize safe haven in parts of the world that are both ungoverned and unreachable with conventional military power. Now, you need to put that on the table when you want to think about targeted killings from unmanned aerial vehicles. And I, and I fully concede it puts in competition, my words now, not yours, John, but I think, I think it captures it, it fully puts into competition exemplary America and interventionist America. Hmm. But the reality of the world is there are people otherwise unreachable who will do you harm. Right, and if I could just briefly follow up, and I don't want to hog the room, but I hope we've got all night, and you know, we've got the general here. Uh, but, but, but just quickly, uh, you know, our best friends are going to be them, not the American ambassador, not the general, not the State Department guy on the field. So I feel like what we've done is we've undercut um, those in the tribal regions, the ones I worked with, who said, yeah, you know, most of the time, if you say you want someone, we don't want the drone strike. We don't want the helicopters coming at midnight. And it was a test. And if they didn't do it, then tactically, the battalion regimental generals I worked with, we would work it out. Um, but we never trusted, I guess, the good nature of them because it was fear. It was constant war. It was let's lump it all with Osama bin Laden. So I look forward to the questions. Yeah, and I, I've just got to add, John and I have different, we, we, have, we have somewhat different historical experiences. It's not a lot different, it's not, actually. It's not binary. It's not binary. But, but his war making experience has generally been with the American armed forces inside international agreed theaters of conflict. All of mine are somewhere else where you don't have the American footprint. And we all, I think, want the best traditions of our nation to last, not some of the worst decisions, which politically I'll give you my two cents. I think that the failures have been fundamentally political, and all of us in the war, 
did the best we could, <laughs> but I would do some things differently, and I bet you would too. All right. Um, Now, I'm betting some people in the audience have questions. Um, we've got two microphones set up. I'll go back and forth between the two, unless there's only people at one. I um, hope everyone will keep it as short as possible and focus on the concept of a question. <laughs> we'll start here first. Hi. Um, I'd like to thank both of you for coming. We really appreciate it. As you can see, we're all really interested in this topic. I have a specific question for General Hayden. Uh, so you spoke of a mission Navy SEALs did in Somalia that allowed them to do a targeted strike um, offshore. And I was wondering if you could speak about a JSOC carried out drone strike on December 12, 2013 of a wedding procession in Yemen that resulted in the death of 12 civilians and 15 others were wounded. Could you please respond to this mission and the very real possibility of inaccurate and fatal drones? Yeah, I'm going to give you a very unsatisfactory answer. No. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I'm, I've been out of government five years. Uh, you're asking about the specifics of the case, and I, I, I simply have no knowledge of the specifics. I'm sorry. Human Rights Watch verified those numbers, um, but could you speak to what it, what it means to be conducting war when you're in a different room, when you're offshore, when you aren't there, you don't have um, eyesight over who you're killing. You don't know what you're getting into, and you, you, you don't know who's going to be there. How do you handle that very real possibility? Yeah, and, and, and again, I, I don't know the specifics of the strike, so I, I can't judge, you know, A or B. Um, but but I, I try to point out, all right, this is not remote control warfare. This is not artificial intelligence warfare. Uh, this, this is warfare that actually has very intense intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Uh, very often, it's, it's additionally enabled by people on the ground, but sometimes the areas are so remote or, or so hostile, uh, you, you don't have that. Are mistakes made? Of course, of course mistakes are made. Um, but again, in a conflict, you gather up the information and go back to the principles of war, necessity, proportionality, distinction, and so on. Do you have the, do you have the, do you have the moral material on which to make a decision? And human beings, you, being human beings, there will be mistakes. So a few bug splat mistakes are okay from time to time. I don't know what you mean by bug splat mistakes. It's worth a few civilian casualties for the ones that count. There is collateral damage in any military option. Thank you. Mm. All right, on this side. All right, so listening to both of you, it seemed like both of you are, correct me if I'm wrong, but both of your biggest um, objections were kind of the psychological effects of drone warfare and um, the idea that it, it would create fear and turn people against the the Americans and it seems like a lot of those psychological effects would also apply when we first started doing airstrikes uh, the same general idea so my first question would be do you think that's an accurate assessment and my second question would be if you could go back and stop airstrikes so we, we're not doing airstrikes now uh, would you do that yeah, I I lived Sadr City, Fallujah, Host, Helmand. I mean, I lived through the conventional airstrikes with Marines and SOF and Delta and read my book. It's all in there, but unclassified. But, you know, I, I think that to go maybe to a point that the general raised, war, A, should be avoided when you can, which was the big Iraq tragedy. But once you're in there, there's a certain dynamic that evolves and we're going to bring to bear assets that we have that doesn't make it easy for anyone and including I would say drone operators but especially for parents I mean the biggest PTSD sufferers are families in other parts of the world not us I think with with this issue um, but when I'm with the Marines the Marines bring air armadas with them and when Zarqawi was in Fallujah he was the number one terrorist target General McChrystal was a three-star general. I, to be frank, 
got an email, didn't really know who he was. Now I obviously do, but, <laughs> but uh, he had a very important job for our government. Zarqawi was there to cause massive casualties, not just among Americans, but among Iraqis too. So that conventional side of war, I would say, is where it's ugly, it's horrible. Believe me, war is just raw, spelled backwards. It's just horrible stuff most of the time. Um, and it should never be gone into unless you absolutely have to. But once you're there, certain things are going to happen and there's a certain dynamic that's going to fold. Once you shift to, I think, this tactic, which then became the easier strategy for presidents who didn't want to have... I found it fascinating when you said, because you walk in and brief the presidents. You walk in and have this incredible um, platform to say to, to be frank, President Obama, who didn't come in with a lot of national security or foreign uh, policy. And I'll confess, I flew from Fallujah to Springfield to see if he was the real deal. Ask me later what I thought, but I mean, I did. I flew all the way there to be like, gosh, is this guy gonna do it? But when you walk in, you set the frame for whether they determine they're gonna bless gray areas or whether they're gonna ask for black and white and fine print. And on this issue, it almost sounds to me like our government, and we've got people here in government, were prepared to say, let's keep it gray. And that's the problem I have, is that the debate needs to be honest inside government and especially among you as citizens. Because that's why you're in college, that's why you're asking great questions, because we all work for you. We actually, to be frank, don't work for the president. President works for us. And if we're unhappy with how things are going, we'll let the president know. To, be, to be totally fair with the, with the historical record, yeah. for better or for worse, George Bush was quite willing to put his personal political prestige at risk by putting Americans in harm's way. President Obama's policy has been, frankly, not to do that, to pull them back, but to double down on, on this particular approach. And it's, we elect presidents to be commander in chief, right? Hi, I'd like to thank you both for being here, first of all, especially you, General Hayden. This, you know, it takes some guts to come to a school this far left. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, here comes that end of civil discourse part. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> He's the uh, leader of the group. Yeah. Uh, I think I got a photo with you, but just make sure we're smiling and we, we all still like the general. <laughs> uh, I put this on my phone. I'm not the best with photos. Uh -oh. So, um, General Hayden, earlier in the debate you said that the U.S. is engaged in a global war. Uh, under that assumption, would you support a drone strike on U.S. soil on a U.S. citizen that does not impose an imminent threat? Good question. Great question. Uh, no. Next question. <laughs> hey, I'll, can I, what's fascinating is states like Colorado, Utah, a few of the renegade states are actually, fascinatingly enough, it seems the American people, their instinct on drones is actually starting to show itself through state legislatures. And as a good, I don't know what your politics are, but as laboratories of, of democracy, states often, whether it's California, the senators from California and others, they, they almost are sort of sometimes ahead of the swamp of Washington and what the American people are thinking. And on drones, if you look at Colorado and I believe Utah recently and a few others, they're starting to say, not in our backyard. And it's fascinating because even though the issue has been the bad guys, the red herring Osama bin Laden, I know why you did it, but it was a red herring, is that at the end of the day, it seems like the American people are very uncomfortable with this notion of drones. And they don't think the hellfire is going to land on... No, and I, my objection to... Do not transfer my comfort level with drones for foreign intelligence purposes to an automatic acceptance that they're equally applicable within the United States for law enforcement or any kind of survey purposes. Quite, quite different. And, and that gets to citizenship, because the other thing I need to put in here is that when the Saudi came up to me in New York, literally 12 years after 9-11, he's a Saudi. Most of those hijackers on those planes were Saudi, which resonated the most with me. You know, Admiral Blair also told me what he really thought about drones, but he didn't say it on stage. Is at the end of the day, you know, what we say about, well, we're Americans, it's our constitution that protects us. I mean, give me a break. If I'm a Yemeni, an Afghan, a Brazilian, a German, and I think, well, all you care about is you and your rights. That's where we lose the strategic um, fight, which isn't just about caves in Pakistan. In my view, General, when they're in caves, there's a reason why they're in caves. They can't be accepted by the people. I mean, that's actually a good place for them to be. So if they're in the middle of Peshawar, that maybe is different, or they're and over in Hoth. That's also bad, yeah. Yeah, but it's, yeah. it's actually pretty good they're in caves. Good. Well, we've, we've tried. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you both. Cue the devious music. <laughs>
I'm actually following up on the last question. Um, I would like to invite both panelists to comment on targeted killings of U.S. citizens, not in the United States, but but abroad, and also um, the placing on U.S. citizens ahead of time on kill lists. And then also, if you can briefly comment on the different types of um, drone strikes. For example, there's been talk in the press about so-called signature strikes versus personality strikes. So if you can comment a little bit on that, thank you. You start, please. Yeah. Well, let me unpack the question. Um, yeah, American citizens. If you accept my premise about, let me make sure I get the Latin right. Jus ad bellum and jus in bello. Okay. If you, if you accept that logic, which justify these these things in the first place, and if you don't, then we're done. All right. Um, American citizenship does not shield an enemy combatant from the American armed forces. Okay. One of the words, enemy, un, unlawful enemy combatant. So a little bit of history here. I hope you're also Googling some of this stuff while we're debating. But unlawful enemy combatant was applied in one war theater, but not the other war theater. So if you're an Iraqi doing bad things, or we thought you were doing bad things, you were actually entitled to more rights than if you're an Afghan. And there's a whole bunch of legal memos. To be frank, General, sometimes I hear our high level people say, well, and you, I know you're a lawyer. The lawyers approved it. Well, I've been in government long enough to know that the lawyers basically work for Dick Cheney if he wants something, or the president, or me if I'm the State Department guy in New York saying, I need support on this. I'm negotiating with the Russians and the Chinese. Give me a break. So I hate this argument, and it really galls me as an American, that somehow there was a patina of legal authorization by guys named Bybee and you. And some of these guys have gotten away with stuff that the historians and the American process is going to come back and find them. Bybee is a judge in Vegas, and, and uh, you is, I guess, a law professor in Berkeley and still in Washington making a lot of money. So at the end of the day, the British had an accountability process on what went wrong in these wars, and I think we're a hell of a lot more honest than we were. And I think we're starting to do that, and we ought to welcome it. We really ought to welcome it. To return the question, which is about targeted killing of a U.S. person, American citizenship does not guard an enemy combatant when in conflict with the armed forces of the United States. Some disagree on that. No, no, I, I, I understand. Yeah. You asked my opinion. Fair enough. And then signature and, yeah. Um, if, you look, if you look at the record, and, and here I just simply have to refer you to Long War Journal or any of the other websites that, that record this. But if, you, if you look at the record, uh, the rate of drone strikes in the tribal region in the last half of 2008, which is the last six months of the Bush administration, set a certain rate. And the general popular story is it doubled in 2009 under President Obama. Actually, it didn't. The, the rate stayed the same. It's just that President Bush didn't start until July. And the rate, the rate was identical. I mean, almost to the third significant digit. If you normalize it for 12 months, they're the same. Then, then in, in 10 and 11, all right, they, they go up much higher, probably the result of policy, but policy reinforced by available, available resources. You will see, if you go to Long War Journal and, and, and go down one of the subsets of uh, HVTs, high value targets, you will see that the rate of HVTs killed is remarkably higher in the first seven or eight months of the campaign in 2008 under President Bush than it became later. All right? Now, that may or may not reflect policy issues. It may or may not reflect that we got all the dumb HVTs in the first six or seven months, and the remainder really took careful precautions to protect themselves. But there was, there's a shift in, in the character of, of the people that, that are, are being assaulted. My understanding, and HVT is you know who it is. It's that person, okay, I'm targeting. Uh, the, the other is a body of evidence in an area, at a compound, with certain activities, with certain key indicators that give, and again, honest people can argue about this, that give the people who have to make the decision, right, reasonable, sufficient reason to believe that that is an armed enemy formation. 
But again, that's such still a gray area, and I, I understand where the general's coming from, but, but it's that second and third, you know, eventually that seem to be pulled back that raised a whole host of we can but should. I mean, a lot of these war issues of we can do it, whether it's also NSA issues, we can and we have the, it's like almost the bionic man, we have the ability, but are we going to do it? And the question is, once we do it, certain things flow from that. The debate needs to precede, I think, that decision memo that he and others at the highest levels of our government were, were working. So throughout the course of the discussion, both of you have been using a form of discourse that implies that you have a very clear idea of who a terrorist is and who, who isn't. But what if the person that you point at claiming is a terrorist is, in actual case, a freedom fighter? Is a freedom fighter? Is a freedom fighter. So both of you mentioned the problem of language, but we really didn't delve into the problem of the definition which terrorism really has. In, in, its, in its kind of fundamental sense, it's a very vague definition, which leaves a lot of room for misinterpretation. It leaves a lot of room for uh, a choice of, of who a terrorist is and who isn't. You know, for instance, during the Arab Spring, all of the, uh, the social movements that went against their governments actually went in under the definition of what a terrorist act was, except they weren't labeled terrorists because their, their cause was, was considered to be righteous. But if we talk about the Israeli situation, for instance, where, where Israel was given a piece of land in what was Palestine at the time with the, Pal uh, with the Balfour Declaration, and basically started eating up the country as a whole in terms of territory. And the Palestinian had not much international recognition at this time, and they didn't have much support from the international community. So what choice did they have but to rise up in arms, which is what they did? Okay, we really need to have a question. Yes, it's coming. One second. So they rose up in arms and they were, you know, consequently labeled terrorists. So if, you know, we're talking about these drones as if we're, we can identify what a terrorist is, but what if that person has, in actual case, a very righteous cause, which is what, what the case was with the Palestinians? So I want, I want to direct this towards the general, please, and just talk about what, what some of the structural issues are here without knowing, you know, what an actual terrorist is. And what sure. Is um, first of all, the, the title of the war that President Bush preferred was Global War on Terrorism. But even within President Bush from day one, uh, we had no legal authority against, against all terrorists. Um, the uh, terrorist surveillance program, uh, the one we refer to here. Warrantless war wiretapping. Yep. Um, as opposed to unwarranted. Okay, I'm sorry. It was actually important, <laughs> an important distinction. My fault. Yeah. Um, Oops. We could only use it against those responsible for the attacks on 9-11, which was defined in law as al-Qaeda and affiliates. We, for example, could not use it against suspected Hezbollah communications, hmm. Hezbollah being a Shia group and not associated with the Sunni terrorists who did 9-11. So it's not a, not, not been a blanket authority against all terrorists of all stripes in all places at all times. It's been a narrowly defined, difficult to define the edges, I get it, subgroup of those who pr represent a danger to the United States. And look, y let me be the one to kind of emphasize, okay, you cannot freeze your government into inaction by continually to parse the decisions that the government has to make. I, I'm sorry, that's obscure. Let me, let me be concrete. Uh, remember lunch, German speech, four things, war and all that? The, uh, so we had a really sporting conversation afterwards. Uh, you know, the, uh, the German ambassador reminded me, Gen General, General, we're all children of the Enlightenment, all right? Uh, I responded, yeah, we read Hobbes, you read Locke, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and he phoned Merkel. <laughs> but I then said, I really, we I really listen. thank you. I really thank you for the opportunity to talk among friends. But let me tell you the real circumstances. I'm going get to get into my Chevy Suburban here. I'm going to be driven across the Potomac. I'm going to go back to my headquarters on the seventh floor at Langley. I'm, I'm going to walk into my office. And if I've got a manila folder around my desk that we've got somebody, I got three choices. Okay? I can give them to a friend. That's rendition. I can give them to Don Rumsfeld. That's Guantanamo. Or I can keep them. That's a black site. But in the real world, you got to choose. Can I make a follow-up question, please? Interesting way of looking at it. If it's brief. Yes, it's, it's very brief. So you mentioned Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, when in actual case there was no real evidence that Al-Qaeda had bases in Iraq. And the, the invasion, the US invasion of Iraq was actually a breach of UN uh, charters. And you actually, you talked about sovereignty and the importance of that. There wasn't really much 
basis to be found. All the UN reports that were done on the matter said that there wasn't really much proof of any weapons of mass destruction being found in Iraq, which later proved to be zero uh, the case. Yes. Uh, so Waiting I mean, I just, I, I just want to hear what you have to say in response to all of this. I mean, knowing and you know, make a choice, but at the same time, also making it making a very you know crucial action from a position of of knowledge rather than what seemed to have been a personal economic interest, uh, which turned out to be the case where Saddam had nationalized all the oil in Iraq, and after they went in, oil wasn't no longer nationalized. So I, yeah. I have a view on Iraq, but I'll let, if you want the general to respond. But I'd like both of you to okay, respond. Okay, I'll, I'll give him some breathing room. Um, Iraq was an unnecessary war that a lot of people got on the bandwagon for on both parties. Your question about terrorism I find to be interesting. I believe, I was in Fallujah looking at dead bodies because my government said, are we fighting Syrian fighters there, terrorists, or in my view, are they homeboys that are pissed off that the United States Marine Corps is there? Red Dawn, we were not the Wolverines. Most of the Marines got that. You guys are too young for that movie <laughs> reference, but for those of you who remember it, get it. At the end of the day, you're right to say, how do we define, and when you're looking at technology and from above, the constant eyes that the general talked about, I don't think, again, we're ever going to be the best judge of that. If they try and kill us, there's a reason to try and kill them before they kill more of us. That's just the equation. But you're right. What's up here is very hard to penetrate if you're the foreigner or if you're the American. I used to tell Washington, every year in Fallujah, I understand 1%. And that was a stretch. It was a hell of a lot more than Washington understood about Fallujah. But I still knew I would only understand about 1% every year I spent there. So when we decide who our friends and collaborators are going to be in these environments, I am of the view we should always defer to those in the communities who obviously are going to know that this cousin is Al Qaeda. This guy's just pissed that you raided his house last night and his mother and his daughter were in the room. And that happened more than the hardcore guys. On Iraq, it was a textbook case of the system of the United States of America failing. I was once in the platinum city of Aspen. I'll tell you a story. And my old boss, Ambassador Negroponte, I have a lot of respect for, was your boss at one point, was on the stage, as was um, one of our members of Congress, um, Jane Harmon. And there was a comment that we don't want to relitigate the past. That, I'm sorry, in my view, is, is where we run into problems. Some things are worth relitigating, whether it is decisions we made because of political issues that we all have to respond to. Relitigating warfare is a pretty serious business, and you're right to put your finger on Iraq. And to your credit, I don't think a lot of, you know, maybe of your generation uh, lived through it, so I'm impressed that you have gone back to that case, because I think two wars, there were two options we had after 9-11, and we decided to do two big wars at once, and they've raised a whole host of questions that the historians will tackle, but more importantly, I think the American people need to tackle. So thank you for raising it, because I don't hear it enough. Thank you for elaborating yeah. on the matter. I mean, I mean, since John put that marker down, the, um, the decision to, to fight in Iraq is a several decision from the one in the authorization for the use of military force against, against al-Qaeda and its affiliates. I mean, they, they are, in their own way, separate legal and logical processes. Um, with regard to the connection, the alleged connection between Iraq and Al Qaeda. I was director of NSA at the time, and we got a lot of questions on this. Um, it, we got so many questions that I actually directed our folks to put a caveat at the top of our reports that simply said, taken, it, taken in its entirety, signals intelligence, that's what NSA does, neither proves nor disproves an operational relationship between Al Qaeda and, and, the, and the government of Iraq. Um, President Obama has made a very clear distinction between the Iraq war and the war, the global war against Al Qaeda. We, we can debate the merits of each, but I, I do think, and although there are con there's connective tissue, I think you need to discuss them in, in separate chains. So in the private meetings, when it was not just on the memos, to your credit, I, I, it's the first time I'd heard that, that you were caveating, sort of signaling to the, the warmongers who were a few people in high levels of our government that wanted the Iraq war before 9-11. Did you then walk into the room and say, time out here? I mean, did you then cross the line of, in my view, moral courage or say, wait a minute, Mr. President? I mean, to, to your question about Iraq, do all of you know that our, our war cabinet never had a debate about invading Iraq? Ever. Ever. 
That's a grade A failure that we as citizens need to think about. Colin Powell's written about it, other people have written about it. So General, I guess I, I credit you for taking on some of the hardest jobs in our government, but then the question I go back to is where did the system work at the biggest and highest levels? Sometimes I think the American people are rightly questioning drones and NSA and spying and are you reading my emails because to be frank, the track record hasn't been transparent, the track record hasn't always been um, upfront. I'm sorry, what, what was the question in that? The statement, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll ask a question. General, would you agree that the American public didn't hear that before we went to war, which you just told us? No, there was a, there was a great debate, and, and, and there, there, were lar there were a large number of dissenting views uh, about that connection. My question is, do you connection. agree that we weren't told that the, the intelligence didn't prove one way or the other? Well, I don't remember. You didn't hear it from me, no. Okay. But for our leaders, I don't remember ever hearing that. But the Iraq war, look, we're, we're down another yeah. rabbit hole here with a different conflict. But it's but an the important Iraq, one. Well, no, of course it's important, and it's related. Uh, the Iraq war, despite, where's, where's the questioner there? Although I manned up and said I got nothing for the Al-Qaeda connection, I was in the room when we voted on the NIE. Hmm. And I said, hey, I got a room full of stuff that he's got a nuclear weapons program. It's all kind of circumstantial, but I got a room full of stuff. All right, so I voted yes for the NIE. Let me, let me elaborate on that, because, you know, Life is, simple. Life is simpler in the rearview mirror mm. than it is through the windscreen. Michael Morrell was the uh, deputy director of CIA, and President Obama really liked him. So Michael was doing most of the presidential handling on the run-up to, to Abbottabad, okay? And, and um, the president says to Michael, whom he was very personal with, Michael, what do your people think in their heart? Is he there or not? So, Mr. President, I got a range. I got, I got some people, people who are 50-50, and I got other people who are 90-10. He goes, that's not very useful, Michael. I mean, you know, why, why the spread? And Michael said, everybody involved in the Iraqi WMD thing's 50-50. Everybody who has done nothing but al-Qaeda for a living is 90-10. And Mr. President, they're all dealing with circumstantial evidence. And you've got this reluctance on this one group and this confidence on the other group. And then Michael said, by the way, Mr. President, we had more circumstantial evidence that Saddam had a nuclear weapons program than we have that Osama bin Laden's in that compound at Abbottabad. Hmm. So this is just hard. Okay, I actually have two questions and I promise my second one will be brief and both of them will be directed towards General Hayden. And before I begin, I want to say thank you very much for your service. I may not respect what you do, but I respect that you do it. Thank you for serving our country. <laughs> um, okay, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah. good. <laughs> That's pretty good for Lewis and Clark. <laughs> um, so at the beginning of your introduction, you said that drones have no value, uh, that it's essentially what they do that is the important thing. Well, actually, the Pentagon... Use them for. Yes, yeah. what you use them for, but actually the Pentagon disagrees. The Pentagon had a $5 billion budget for drones in 2012. And uh, with, I think, $4.5 to $11 million for a U.S. Predator drone and $30 million for a uh, U.S.-made Reaper drone. Those actually are fun to say. And, um, <laughs> let's, and it's $30,000 an hour to fly a U.S. military drone. And with one political party pushing to cut taxes and the other political party pushing to actually have schools, what is your justification for spending money to destroy another country's infrastructure instead of building up on our own? One of the first responsibilities of an elected government is to defend its citizens. All right. Thank you. Um, anything else? No. Okay. <laughs> um, Second. But you're right to raise how expensive uh, warfare and how you're, no one, we didn't talk about that. It's a very expensive, and at some point it's zero sum. It's a limited pie we've got. Yeah, thank you. Um, and my second question, and I assume, and I, uh, you're an expert on this. Uh, how, many, uh, how many drones would it require for complete visual surveillance of the U.S.? <laughs> depends, depends on the drone. <laughs> Those ones are cheaper. No, I mean, look. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm the, visual, all right? So by visual, do you mean electro-optical? Yes. Okay. It depends on the altitude of the drone and the endurance of the drone. Could we it see them? It depends on the quality of the photography you want. This why, is Orwellian, why, but continue. Why, why, are you, why, are you ask, why are you asking? 
because uh, I really disagree with the NSA, and I want to say like you guys are. Come on, let's 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 let, let's let's do something unusual. Let's inject facts into our discussion. All right, I like that. What does what does NSA have to do with visual observation? Well, you guys do a lot of auditory. Hmm. You guys do a lot of auditory observation, and like things are progressing. Not, in society. Not, actually, not quite auditory in terms of sound waves. All right, it's electronics. It's electrons and photons. But you listen to our words, and you use those for sound bites. I'm Would sorry. You... When you when you say we listen to your words, what do you mean? Well, uh, from my understanding, the NSA has systems which track for key words if they're spoken in a phone conversation. Uh, so let's say I how would how would NSA capture your conversations? Because from my understanding, you do have programs that do actively survey through American communications. I'd say, I'd say that again. You do have programs that actively survey through American locations. They don't specifically target key Americans, but they do go through a certain percentage of phone calls. I believe it's 200 million text messages a day are read by the NSA. Or Here, at least are you talking about by the domestic programs. phone calls or phone calls over, that are collected overseas? Domestic. No. no. But if, if he has a friend in Germany, you're fair game. Okay. No, not, That's the no, distinction. No, no, he's, no, no, John, he's not. It's, it's intercepted, though. No, it, it, could it may be. or may not be intercepted if his friend in Germany is or is not a legitimate foreign intelligence. Okay, star. I have a question because my FOIA request was and denied by, here. by the having, NSA. I'm having trouble getting to the hoop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the premise of your question, that NSA actually possesses the content of your domestic communications, is false. It's stored, though, right? No, it's not. No. <laughs> That's not due to my understanding. From my reading, um, I forget the name of the computer technology the NSA uses, but they do have a program that does actively sift through U.S. techs. No. Um, it's, it, I'll, hit, hit, I'll hit my Google machine. The whole, like, uh, it's no, pretty oh, easy to pull up. Oh, no, Eric Schmidt may have something that goes <laughs> through your text. Yes, that may be done by Google. Okay. Okay. Well, that's the end of my question, then. But Jones aren't No, like, it's really important. <laughs> Look, he and I are up here with different views, but fairly common experiences, so, so we have some realities to attach it. If you're going to play, you really have got to drill down on really obscure, obscure stuff and, and understand what it is you're objecting to. Could NSA has billing records of about 30% of the phone calls made daily in the United States. There is no content in that, it's called the 215 program. But you do see when I contact people from foreign nations, which could put, put me on Since 1952, so when NSA was formed, when NSA is intercepting as a legitimate foreign intelligence activity, foreign communications, it does not have to stop covering the legitimately targeted foreigner merely because a protected person, that would be you, is one of the communicants. Let me give you a concrete example. Mm -hmm. I got a bad guy in that cave in the Hindu Kush. Okay? <laughs> Which is good he's there yeah, because we yeah. can Yeah, but he's, but he's got a but he's got a cell phone. And he calls a confederate in Islamabad and says, "Brother, zero hour is tomorrow." And then he calls a confederate and and I say goes, "Whoa, that's cool. Better tell ISI." And then he calls a confederate in Paris and says, "Brother, zero hour is tomorrow." Oh, tell, ooh, great, great, tell DGSE. Then he calls a confederate in London, says, brother, zero hours tomorrow. Okay, great, tell MI5. And then he calls somebody in Portland. And you expect NSA to go, oh, damn, if he just wasn't an American, I'd know where that attack was too. That's madness. You stay on the call. Actually, I believe there's a Five Eyes program where we work with foreign surveillance from the UK, Australia. Do not Australia. dare to presume all that right. NSA can request a foreign intelligence service to do anything NSA is not itself allowed to do. Thank you. Thank you. So if one were to have emails come in regularly from Fallujah, Host, Pakistan, someone like me, I mean, to be frank, I had the SA clearance, but I mean, I'm emailing all the time, I would hit the grid in a way. Whether, whether they would actually then read is something they'd have to go, I think, through a process for. Of course. But, but, but the fact is, is that I've got emails from we, Fallujah to I, this week. The second week. hour and a half is on the NSA program now. We're right in the middle of this, <laughs> all right? Remember Brent Scowcroft and the pieces on the board and power down and integrated, yada, yada, yada? There's another big change, too. 
Okay? NSA spent most of its natural life looking at a very slow-moving oligarchic nation-state called the Soviet Union. Most of you don't remember that, but it's in all the books. All right? <laughs> One of the prime targets in the Soviet Union was Soviet strategic rocket forces. And we, would, we spent the gross domestic product of a small country putting things in orbit so that we could get behind the microwave shots that the Russians were using to communicate from strategic rocket forces headquarters in Moscow to their ICBM fields out beyond the Urals in Soviet Asia. You know, kind of paying attention, looking for words of interest to pop up, like launch, okay? <laughs> the 2014 equivalent of that are proliferator, terrorist, narco-trafficker, precursor chemical dealers, et cetera, et cetera, communications, emails, coexisting with your emails in a global, integrated, worldwide web. If you expect your state to detect those things that are now the modern equivalent of that SRF launch code, if you expect your state to collect those things, your state must be in the flow where your emails are as well. That's the simple nature of things. Now, I think NSA does it very well and still respects your privacy. But the world has become so much more integrated that le legitimate foreign intelligence targets, the ones you want covered, okay, are sitting there commingled with your stuff. That's the way it is. If you, don't, if you don't trust NSA to do it, tell your elected representative and turn them off. You'll be a hell of a lot more comfortable and you'll be a hell of a lot less safe. Hmm. And that's the debate. Okay. So I'm gonna bring the question back to what we're actually here for. Um, I, I respect the issue. I'm in. I, I, I respect <laughs> the issue, but um, I, wanna, I wanna maintain the legitimacy of this debate and not jump on a hot button political issue. Um, I would, I'm working, this question is working on the assumption that both of you agree that there are psychological in implications to automated drone warfare, both in, both in paranoia, paranoia that you've experienced in Afghanistan, talking with um, you know, citizens that, that fear drones, that fear both um, surveillance and destruction, also with the distress of operators um, in Nevada working that basically, um, that joystick warfare that you've used, that they're working the psych psychological implications and speaking of those implications, how do you feel that the global pursuit of automated warfare will distort our world's notion of war and the sacrifice war brings and how will those implications of understanding war um, affect and distort um, countries' national interest in the accumulation of military power. This is a question to both of you, because oh, okay. um, it's relevant to, I, I believe it's relevant to both of you. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first, and I'll, I'll simply echo one thing I said earlier, then add an additional point. The thing I said earlier about the video game syndrome, that, that we just have, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is we have no evidence of that. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's, it's a high-stress job, because you really intimately get to know your target. Like I said, you watch him playing with his kids for eight hours, waiting for him to get in the car, let him drive off 100 yards, and go ahead and launch the Hellfire. So that's, that's high psychic impact. Uh, I, also, I also fear that, that political leaders will look upon this as a cheap way of saying, look, I'm doing something without investing the political and personal capital needed to really be serious uh, about an effort. Back kind of the Rahm Emanuel thing, you get to do it forever because you're not putting enough in to change the facts on the ground. One, one final additional thing, I, this is just me talking on behalf of my wife, who is a member of the National Military Family Association's National Board, and that's the stress that all this combat has on, uh, has on people. And certainly the Marines in Fallujah, the Marines in Helmand, under great stress. Let me give you another kind of stress. You're a drone operator, you're, you're a drone operator at Nellis. You've spent, you spend 12 hours in the cockpit, you're flying the drone, you're controlling the electro-optical device, you're doing all the things, making all the decisions like I just said, wait until he kisses her goodbye, give him 200 yards, and so on. You get, you get done with your 12-hour shift, you get in your SUV or your van, and you drive back to the main base at, at Nellis, and you go in and greet your wife, and she says, you were supposed to get milk. <laughs> think, 
think of the, the emotional dissonance in somebody who has literally been in combat psychologically for 12 hours and is now in a completely civilianized environment with all the expectations that that, that brings. That's, that's something we haven't studied. And I'll just briefly follow up. I, there's no question I think there's a cost for drone operators. And for all my Marine friends in the room, hugely costly when your nation says go to war in Iraq, when it and come home and try and adjust and buy the milk. Um, but I will always believe that it's the Afghan families, the Pakistani families, the Yemeni families who picked up pieces of grandma down the road because we did make a mistake. I'm not saying there's no intentional, I don't believe there's a devious plot by Americans you know, behind the drone operating board to do bad things. It's just our government has put them in a position, to be frank, where accountability should flow up. The people that he rightly described as suffering the consequences are the ones we don't often think about because there's a lot of, you know, cover your butt in Washington. So at, at the end of the day, I guess I though will say they, who are never in these debates and never in the White House and never at the Langley discussion rooms or ever in my meetings, to be frank, when I was in Washington or even with the Marines in Fallujah. I mean, we occasionally met with Iraqis in quite a bit, but they were in high House meetings that never fully appreciated how war fundamentally, their war, our war front was their home front. And we should always remember that. Our war front was their home front. If Fallujans walked into my hometown, I always thought, what would I do? Would I collaborate? Would I fight? Would my cousin pick up a gun and say, I'm sick of Lance Corporal Marine Corps, or I'm sick of the State Department guy who talks forever? I mean, who knows? You know? And that's where we lose sight that what was our foreign war was their home front war. And, and, and that's the one message, I guess, is we probably don't have a lot of time, and I know the general's busy and gotta, gotta leave, but let's remember that, 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 that we were there and th th they were at home. Um, and if we do that, I think we'll probably be better at what we all wanna do, which is save lives. I mean, at the end of the day, we don't wanna kill more people than we have to, we don't. But now, we do need to kill some people, but just not some who we've been killing. I wanna ask a quick follow-up question. It's probably my fault for a confusing question. I wanna ask very direct. With automated drone warfare, how do, you, how do you feel each of you automated drone warfare will affect each individual's national interest and the global national interest for technological advancement? How do we define technological advancement in another country and relevance that to yeah. lethal technology creating drones abroad and how that distorts national interest for technological advancement? I, I may be misunderstanding how you're framing the question, but, but I, I just wanna make the point, American drone warfare is not automated. There is a human in the loop. He's just not in the aircraft. Okay, so that's, that's very important. Yeah, spread of drone technology um, will we'll make other nations capable. Uh, compressed time, 20 minutes, holding up the sign, not much time left to go. One of the other points I, I had in my notes about things you gotta worry about, all right, if you keep, China keep, and Russia. keep doing this, well, is what precedent, not, not just that they're gonna, they're gonna get it, what, have we what set? precedent yeah. do we set with regard to the use of these weapons as, as we go forward? Right, and that actually is a huge one because the America that I love to represent is the America that people want to follow and respect and be feared when we need to be feared. Once we start to go down certain paths, that's where we strategically lose. And I'm not talking about Mr. Putin and his issues. I'm talking about the world needs a strong, respectable, good, what is it that Churchill said, America is great because America is good? Well, where we're not acting very well or we're not acting good, we ought to admit it and try and fix it. And that's where I, you know, it's not just the, 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 the arms race, the new technology race. It's to me a fundamental sense of are those generations around the world gonna believe that America represents what's working that should be supported versus something or someone that's detached doing something above that I'm gonna tell my children go to bed or the drones are gonna get you. It's funny and sad. And I, I just don't like when my nation has entered into that vocabulary in faraway places. I would rather have, again, more of those kids say, geez, there's one country that made it to the moon and that's a good thing. And we ought to try and strive for that as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Got one more question, Bob, and then we'll stop, I think. Okay, okay so I had one for each. Is that gonna work? Mm -hmm. Quickly. Okay, so, um, 
Mr. Wesson, and thank you both for being here tonight. Um, from your response to Professor Bichelle's question, it seems as though you agree with uh, General Hayden's uh, third policy statement, which was that using drone warfare may actually increase the amount of insurgencies and rebellions that we see, or the amount of individuals moving into the training camps. However, um, you're closer to the State Department than I. Do you have alternatives that would keep Americans off of the soil, out of direct conflict, that would keep our image and our integrity, as you're saying, what keeps America good, without also losing our edge, losing the chance to prevent a threat? That's a hard balance to strike. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I, I saw the best of America in these wars, and I saw the worst. And the balance, unfortunately, was not what I'd like it to have been. It was still more good than bad, and that hasn't been reported enough. But I'm not beyond saying we as citizens need to hold ourselves accountable, and we need to hold our military, our leaders, you know, grunts like me, that what I, what I guess with the Marines, and I can speak to them, um, is I saw the best linguists, corporals, not me. I like to wish I could walk in and speak the language. I didn't. I was not good at languages. I was lazy, whatever. But, but at the end of the day, I saw some corporals sit out in front of the Fallujah Seamock every day, and not only were they intel sources, to be frank, like what's going on in the city. I mean, I had good contacts, too. They called me Kalal Fallujah, which is both good and bad. But, but these corporals were representing the best of America. Now they're home trying to go to the grocery store and choose the milk. And that's why when high levels of our government say, we're not going to really litigate this stuff, I'm sorry. <laughs> when you go to war, you are accountable for a very long time. The story I wanted to end with is I didn't want us to leave thinking, and you guys are younger, and so you know, I know you haven't lived through the freaking 13 years like he and I and a lot of others have in this room. Um, that even with the darkness and the horror and the blood and the killing and the w, double amputations that were happening in Helmand when I left, there was still an American story that broke through. And that's what you guys need to be part of. You need to be the people that remind first ourselves what that means when we talk about a constitution, which is the ultimate document that guides whether the NSA does things or not, to be frank. It's the ultimate sources and methods document. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that's what we all have to do. Because then the American, I think, image to the world takes care of itself. It's beyond the media, it's beyond Twitter, it's beyond Facebook, whatever. It's actually that it's a place that says, we're big enough to look in the mirror and stare hard and see where the cracks are and admit it. And that's, I think, what our Senate, that's, I think, what we as citizens have to do in order uh, to do right by those corporals and to do right by the families who, to be frank, are always going to have more PTSD than I have. I mean, that's, that's true. They live under the drones. They live under the threat. They've had things go wrong. They have to manage the Al-Qaeda guys or the Taliban guys. So everything we did that undercut them, I was trying to be like, look, let's look at the war through their eyes. And then occasionally we need to do things for our own interests. I'm Believe me, when I was in New York, I used to tell the Swedes, if I get an airplane and fly to Stockholm from London, it's a different threat potential than <laughs> if I fly to New York. Mm -hmm. And they had to nod their head in good Swedish fashion. Yeah, and I'm like, but that's what I'm paid to do. <laughs> but it didn't mean I was a dick like Rumsfeld used to be you know, to these governments. I was saying we need you to work with us to do these things. So it's a great question. I think those are the issues that you all need to help us as a, whether a general who followed political orders or myself, you know, in the dusty streets of wherever I was. Because, you know, we're tired and I think we're, we're ready to reflect, but, but you have that, I think, uh, opportunity. Because there is no greater, I think, honor than representing the United States of America, despite these controversies. And that is something that, that we all should feel good about. We still represent, when we're honest, um, what's right and not what's wrong. But we've done some wrong things that we need to think about. Thank you. Can I? So that is a really great segue for me for my question for General Hayden. So um, as a 23-year-old recent college graduate trying to do exactly what Mr. Wesson here is suggesting, become more active, become more involved, um, given the recent political trends from Citizens United to the gutting of the VRA to the lack of transparency about things like international warfare and our use of drones and where they are and who they're attacking. Um, how would you suggest, how do, you, how do we ensure that, you had a quote earlier, and I hope I'm not garbling it, but that we have a very unique view of this war. We have a? Very unique, 
view of this war. I believe it was in the German story, the sitting down at the table. Um, and however, your view and my view are, are very different. And perhaps many people in this room have a different view. As a young person, how do I convey that effectively to someone in your ear as you have the president's ear? Well, no longer. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted another ear, <laughs> and I accepted that. <laughs> um, it's, part of, it's part of public dialogue. Um, you know, just, uh, let me side with John on a couple of points here. I mean, I'm really proud to serve the American people. I'm really proud to spend my life defending the American people. We're not bad, all right? We really aren't. Um, and, 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 our, and our instincts, our instincts are, are positive. And, and so we, we need to become involved in, in these, these kinds of discussions. We, it's, it's really a hard question for somebody like me. Right? I'm, yeah, I'm 39 years in the Air Force, but fundamentally an intelligence guy. Mm. In the last 10 years of my career, I'm doing CIA and NSA. That's really kind of secret stuff. You know, if I had my wish, I wouldn't tell you anything. Right? <laughs> in an operational way. But it doesn't survive inside our political culture. All right? I mean, I used to, uh, I, I used to say NSA needed to be only two things to be successful. Powerful and secretive. And we exist inside a political culture that frankly just trusts only two things, hmm. power and secrecy. And so how does a free people, how does a democracy like us, all right, actually conduct secret espionage? I mean, and, and then, <clears throat> you probably know this, but let me say it. Espionage has to be secret to be successful. <laughs> and so how, how, do, how, do you, how, do you, how do you square, square that circle? We thought we had a formula in the late 1970s with the oversight committees in the House and, and Senate, the Sissy and the, and the Hipsy and the, and the FISA court. It's the one that I embrace certainly as my contribution to transparency. I couldn't tell 350 million of my countrymen what I was doing without letting the enemy in. So I'm telling this select group of overseers. By the way, okay, right now you, you are a citizen of a nation that has the most transparent and the most overseen intelligence community on the planet. There is no one else in our area code in terms of transparency, accountability, and parliamentary oversight. And not, not the British, certainly not the French. Okay, so we're, we're starting at a, at, a, at a different point. But I'm agreeing with you, it's no longer sufficient. I mean, NSA in this last fluffle said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. It's been authorized by the president, actually been authorized by two presidents. I got, I got both chambers of commerce with bipartisan majority saying you're good to go. It's overseen by the FISA court. That's the Madisonian trifecta, go away. <laughs> and then folks like you, and I, I say this publicly, and I, and I say serious people, not, okay, serious people say, okay, you told the court, you told the Congress, the president knew, but you didn't tell me. And that's where we are now. Uh, when I was director of CIA, I had a civilian advisory board, prominent Americans. We don't put their name out, it's privacy, it's not secret. But one individual has given me the okay. Carly Fiorina, formerly of Hewlett Packard, ran for Senate in California. I gave Carly a, a tough problem in her subcommittee. Prominent Americans. Will America be able to conduct espionage in the future inside a broader political culture that every day demands more transparency and more public accountability of every aspect of national life? And they went away, talked to smart people, huddled among themselves, came back three or four months later, said we got an answer. I walked across the hall, top deck at, at Langley, sat down in my conference room, said, okay, will America be able to conduct espionage inside a political culture every day, demands more transparency in them? Carter looked me in the eye and said, eh, not sure. Which is a really big deal. I mean, there's a new series on AMC called Turn. Okay. It's about America's first spy ring. Okay. George Washington was America's first spy master. Okay. George Washington, when he became president, demanded a secret budget for covert action. This is baseball and apple pie stuff. We've been spying as long as we've been Americans. And now, and now the question is, and I don't have an answer, the question is, how do I get consent of the governed to do these things in the kind of transparent society we are becoming. And if the governed decide the balance is out of whack, we all work for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The president works for you. you know, so. 
I used to, I used to do it like this. I'd say, hey, look, okay, here's the box. Just for God's sake, just tell me where the box is, and I'll work inside the box. President Obama changed the box on January 22nd, 2009, when he closed CIA black sites. And I sent a letter to the CIA workforce on that date saying, the president has given us the only thing we need from him. He has given us clear guidance. We now have a smaller box. We are still going to be mean people inside that box. We're going to be really tough, but we're going to play inside the new lines. All right? So we want the box from the American political process. Just tell us where the lines are. There, there's a, there's a subcode to this too, though, all right? If that's the box, and because, well, you know, people complain, and uh, I made a speech on the floor of the Senate, and okay, and, and the box, we, we play back from the lines, all right? I'm no longer protecting you, I'm protecting me. And I would tell you as a citizen, if I don't play out to the limits of the box and a really bad thing happens, let me show you the new box. You're going to insist, you're going to insist on drawing. And so an aggressive espionage service, an aggressive counterterrorism campaign within law, reflecting the will of the Amer and values of the American people, isn't just about your security. It's about your future liberty. Well, and that's actually a really interesting way to end it because that will be the test. You know, the, the, the doomsday scenario, you know, the, the nuke goes off somewhere or whatever is where we have to decide, are we going to become the shut it all down, get rid of all the, I mean, Japanese Americans, what did we do in World War II? The Supreme Court said it's okay to round them up, shoot them from San Francisco to Topaz Mountain and other places. I have to say, we failed. Was the threat there potentially, but we've got, our, we've got to look at our own history. We rounded up American citizens who happen to be Japanese Americans. I have friends in San Francisco, a female diplomat I work with, she's from San Francisco, and you know that part of our history factors into where we decide that balance is gonna be. But the doomsday scenario for me sort of is the fear taken to an extreme. You're right, the potential's always there, and governing people never have the luxury of being wrong. Because when you're wrong once and it's the big problem, then suddenly the politicians are running for the you know, blame, blame game. So I, I just want to end by saying I have a really, uh, I'm glad we we're able to share the stage. This gentleman has spent a lot of time on tough issues. You're right to nail us on hard questions. Um, but continue to continue to, 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 to dig um, because that's what only you can do and we, whether we're in government or formally, uh, we respond to the will of the people and the will has to be communicated. Well, thank you very much, um, John Weston and General Hayden. Thank you all for coming, and I also maybe give yourselves a round of applause. It was great how civil this was. It was really well done. Thank you, everyone. Um, and Bob asked me to say the next session is tomorrow at 3.30, and it's Guns for Good, Militarizing Humanitarian Intervention. And is it here? Okay, great. All right, thank you very much. Well, I, I think...